Well, good morning, everyone. How are you today? Oh, my word. The rain's got y'all down, don't it? But you know what? This is a day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Tell you what. Turn to your neighbor. Welcome them to Liberty Baptist. And tell them how much you love them in the Lord. Now, if you're a visitor here with us today, we just want to say a special welcome to you. We'd like to get to know you a little bit better, and there's two ways that you can do that. If you've got one of our proclaimers here, you will find a QR code inside. You can scan that. Give us a little information about yourself. Uh, the other way is you can pick up one of our visitor cards at the welcome desk, fill that out, drop it in one of the boxes at the exits, and we would get you some more information about us here at Liberty Baptist. Now, if you're looking to give your tithes and offerings today, you can do that one of two ways as well. You can go to libertybconline.org and give that way, or you can get one of your uh, tithing and offering envelopes from the ministry center desk, fill it out, and drop that envelope in the boxes at the exits. So, didn't we have a great week last week? It was a wonderful week, you Sunday, and I just up front just want to say to everybody, thank you very much for all the calls, texts, emails, personal conversations that I had about our youth. Um, our youth love Liberty Baptist. They love you. We appreciate the support. And, you know, God really worked in them last week. God made a move in them. And uh, we're just praying that that move would continue uh, for the rest of their lives and that they can go out to the, all the world and preach the gospel. So if you have your proclaimer with, me, with you today, if you'll follow along with me, we've got a few announcements for you. So our groups and Bible studies are set to begin. Now, you can find those one of two ways. You can go to our website at libertybconline.org, or you can pick up one of these handy-dandy flyers. Now, I like the flyers, right? And so I'm going to push you just a little bit by pushing this flyer. If you notice this half of this flyer right here, this is Wednesday nights. These are Wednesday night activities that you can take part of here at Liberty Baptist. Now, you say, what do I do with my teenagers? Come on, what am I going to do with them? Well, tell you what, drop them with me for an hour and a half. We'll have a blast. We'll talk about the Lord. Uh, but get yourself in a group. What was the message? Don't, don't tell me you forgot last week. Let's participate, right? Let's just show up. Let's be part of this family here at Liberty Baptist uh, Church and bring your kids out and they can participate with me. Widow's Valentine Luncheon. So Liberty Baptist Church is hosting a Valentine luncheon for all of our widows, which are the Golden Girls, on Tuesday, February the 14th at Waterfront Cafe in Farmville. Now, here's the key point. Transportation is provided. You do not have to worry about getting yourself there. So if you haven't signed up for that reason, it's still time to do it. There's still time to call the church office and be part of that fellowship. We really want you to be part of it. A lot of people worked hard to, to get this put together, and I know everybody's looking forward to it. Now, here's my public service announcements for everybody. Guys, Valentine's Day is coming up. If you have not already made plans, the onus is on you. It is not on your lady. It is not on your wife. The onus is on you. Take care of it, okay? I just want to, yeah, okay, I'm getting, yeah, hand claps about that. So, look, don't say you didn't hear it. Don't say you forgot, because I just told you. Now, moving on. So, <laughs> we're getting ready to have a night of worship, and that is called Magnify. And I'm going to turn to my friend right here, and I worship Pastor Cliff, and Cliff is going to tell you all about that. Thanks, Tommy. Friday night, we encourage you to come out here at 7 o'clock right here in the Ministry Center. We're going to have an evening of singing worship songs, praying together, looking in Scripture with the whole theme of the whole night is being to magnify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you to come out. We're going to spend time with the Lord. We're going to lift up his name in this place, and I know you will be blessed and encouraged in your walk as you take the worship that we have on Friday night and carry it with you throughout the rest of the week. Come out Friday night. We'd love to see you. Well, thank you, Cliff. I'm going to tell you what, you do not want to miss this. You want to be a part of this. You're going to be blessed just for showing up and being there. 
Our financial peace class is getting ready to take place on Sunday, February the 19th at 9.30 a.m. here right here in the Ministry Center. If you want to be taking part of that course, uh, you can sign up. The sign-up information is right here in your proclaimer. Our trail life group right here at Liberty is going to go to Liberty University, and they're going to go to the observatory. And if you would like to be part of that, contact Tim Webb, and he will give you more details about that. Our congregational meeting. Uh, congregational meeting is going to take place on Sunday, February the 26th at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary. There will be a financial report uh, as well as other reports from the elders, the stewardship committee. And this meeting is, is to inform each and every one of you. We want you to know what's going on here at Liberty Baptist. So come out, be a part of that meeting, and be informed. Our Red Cross Bloodmobile is getting ready to take place right here in the Fellowship Hall on Monday, February the 27th. And that's going to take place from 12 p.m. Um, to 6 p.m. And if you'd like to schedule a time to donate, you need to call the number that is provided in your proclaimer. So one last announcement. For those of you who've been asking me about youth camp, uh, I had to get through youth Sunday last week. So here's the deal. Youth camp you, you are able to go ahead and register your child. You should have gotten already gotten information about that. If you have any questions about it, please feel free to give me a call. Now, church family, I'm just going to give a heads up. A lot of you like to donate, and you like to take care of these kids going to camp. We are trying to outreach even kids out beyond Liberty Baptist this year. So any help that you can provide by getting a student to camp would be greatly appreciated. If you'd like to do that, feel free to come up and talk to me, or you can contact the church office, and they'll get you in touch with me. So without further ado, I'm going to get all of you to stand. Put a smile on your face as if you're smiling at the Lord, and he's smiling back at you, and let's worship him in song. Well, good morning, church. John paints a beautiful picture for us in Revelation of all of creation around the throne of Jesus, giving him glory and honor and praise as the lamb who was slain for our sins, the one who is worthy of our praise. Let's lift up his name in this place, our holy Savior. I can't wait for eternity. Join the song they're already singing. Just to bow down before your throne, see your face, I'll cry out, because you're holy, holy, holy are you. Sing his name out.
Yes, you are worthy. You are worthy as the one who has saved us, the one who has given your life for us as our Savior, the one who shed his blood for us and redeemed us. We stand in awe of you, Lord. Let's sing this hymn together. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean oh lift it up This is your testimony. Sing it out. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. Yes. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. love and mercy and grace. We build our life on you, our firm foundation. It does not fail. It stands firm no matter what circumstance. And Father, we put our trust in you this morning as the one who never fails, the one who never falters. This is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why?
believe it. He wants. I still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I feel my life on Jesus. So why would 
bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. And God, may we cling to the truth that, God, you will not fail us. God, that you have a plan for the world that we cannot accomplish. But God, you will accomplish it. God, today in this place, may we admit our inability. God, may we admit what we cannot do. God, today, may we admit and trust you for what you can do. God, when the situations around us look bleak, God, we know that you are the God who has promised to make all things new. And so, God, in that, we trust you. God, we pray for the person today who has never trusted you, even for the first time. God, for the person today who is not a Christian, may today they feel their inadequacy, their inability. And God, today, may they say, I trust you, Jesus. May they put their faith and trust in you for life today and life eternally. God, we pray for the needs of our church. God, every week there are people in so many different circumstances that need our intercessory prayer. God, we pray for those who are quietly struggling. God, no one knows their problems, but God, you do. God, we pray for those who are sick. God, we pray that you would raise them up. God, we also celebrate. God, we celebrate the marriages that are happening in this place this month. We celebrate our youth ministry. God, we thank you for last Sunday, and we pray that you would just kindle in the heart of our students a passion to know you more. God, would you raise up a generation that loves you, that is ready to serve you. God, may we do everything that we can here at this church to encourage them and support them. God, I pray today that we would be faithful. God, in this place that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. God, today we would surrender our hearts to you. And God, that we would leave from this place with a fresh expression of our faith. God, we won't trust you on faith expressed in other days. But God, today we would say, we trust you. We leave from this place with a renewed confidence, not in ourselves, but in you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
for me and my house. We're going to serve you, Lord. So here's the keys. Come on in. Everything we have is yours. As for me and my house, we're going to serve you, Lord. Here's the keys. Come on in. Everything we have is yours. Oh, here's the keys. Well, good for you who braved what is pretending to be an actual Virgin, Virginia winter. So that's uh, good for you. I had a few people say when they woke up this morning, they looked outside, they saw the temperature, they saw the rain, they thought, man, the bed would feel really nice. And so good for you to get up out of the bed and to be here today so that we can gather around God's Word together. I don't know about you, it's been two weeks. Uh, by the way, you Sunday was great last week, and uh, happy for a break in our series. But uh, today we re-engage the person of Abraham as he takes his journey of faith. And it really is a journey. Abraham has many stop-off points where he moves forward in several places where he moves backwards. I think today when we think about faith, we ought to ask a very basic question. It's at least a question that kind of rose to my mind as I read Genesis 15. And that question is, why is it so hard to trust God? You see Abraham, the man of faith, not just having a moment of faith, but moving from faith to faithlessness to faithfulness, back to faithlessness to faithfulness. And so it is not a straight line. So the question is, why is it so hard to trust God? I think the answer to that question might actually lie in a more simple question. And that is the question, why is it so hard to trust, period? We live in a world in which there are many broken promises. There are unfulfilled expectations. And just the idea, even if there aren't broken promises, and even if there aren't unfulfilled expectations, just the idea that I take my life and I place it into the hands of another person, that idea alone creates a great deal of vulnerability for the person who says, here, I'm going to give you what I cannot do. You do it for me. I do think some people have easier paths to trust and other people have more difficult paths to trust. One of the simple reasons that is, if I were to ask you today, there's something you cannot do. You must entrust it to someone else. Write down the list of trustworthy people that you would entrust important things to do. Some of you would have a very long list of trustworthy people, and some of you would have a list that would not be so long. You'd say, I don't really trust anybody. Well, that's not good. You say, when we think about trust, by the way, we shouldn't trust everybody. That's, that's true. You would be unwise if you trusted everybody. The Proverbs would say, you're naive if you trust everybody. 
However, trust is appropriate when the person that you place your trust in has proven their trustworthiness. And so while it may make sense in many circumstances to not trust another person, it makes sense in no circumstances not to trust in a trustworthy God. And so we ought to be careful. We ought to say, I need to be careful with my trust. I trust because someone is trustworthy, but God should be trusted because he alone is faithful and true all the time in every situation. I think this is the lesson of faith. This is the journey of faith to learn how illogical it is to fail to trust in the one who embodies trustworthiness. Abraham's working on it. We're working on it. Let's keep working on it together. If you have a Bible, Genesis chapter 15. This is a very important text in the life of Abraham because in essence, Abraham has his big moment of faith in the text today. Our first big idea is to develop faithfulness. We must understand that our right standing before God is based upon faith alone. There are some unique features about our text today I want to point out, but let's just listen to these seven verses. It says, after these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision Do not be afraid, Abram, for I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Abram continued, look, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. Now the word of the Lord came to him. This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the sky and count the stars. If you are able to count them, he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. Genesis 15, 6, a very important text. We'll highlight more today. Abram believed the Lord, and he, that is the Lord, credited it to him, that is Abram, for righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. Now, sometimes when we read through the Bible, it goes at a pace that's hard to keep up with. I actually heard two weeks ago, Genesis 14, when there were so many kings and so many wars and so many uh, things happening all at once. On top of that, with a lot of names that were hard to pronounce, I heard a church member say, I'm lost. (laughs) And honestly, sometimes when you read through the biblical text, so much is happening so fast, you're like, "Uh, I'm having a hard time keeping up. And even though the text is rather short, the events in such a few words become to pile up. But today, everything slows down because this is the first time in the Abraham story that God and Abraham talk to each other. So God has spoken, Abraham has spoken, but they haven't spoken to each other. Where God says something, Abraham responds, God says something back. This is the first dialogue. It's sometimes important to tune in when the dialogue starts because we learn a lot about God and we're gonna learn a lot about Abraham by what they say. Now, the first verse begins after these events. You might have forgotten about the events two weeks ago in Genesis 14, but here's a quick synopsis. Abraham and Lot have become very wealthy. God has held good to his promise that he would bless them and has blessed them financially. And so Abraham and Lot have so much that they have to divide because they can't keep all their herds together in one place. Lot picks the better land near the Jordan River, and Abraham is still in the promised land, but he's on the corner of the promised land. He's got on the ugly corner of the promised land. 
because in the good part of the promised land, they're the Canaanites. They took the good spot. So Abraham, trying to be faithful to the promise of God, is kind of sitting on the ugly part of the promised land, hoping one day he'll get the good part because that's what the Lord promised. Well, Lot's picked the better land, so he seems. Well, in the ancient world, there's always a fight. In the modern world, there's always a fight too, but in the ancient world, you got in the fight because you didn't have any other option. And so Lot is taken away by warring kings, which puts Abraham in a tough spot because he's got to go rescue his relative. He rescues his relative, Lot, by defeating a warring king and some other kings who were with him. It actually says uh, in Genesis 14, verse 7, after Abram returned from defeating Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him. Now, I want you to think about how that event sets up our dialogue for today, what God has to say to Abraham. This is probably not a good time to bring this up, but I have gotten in a few fights in my life, you know, when I was younger. Um, you know, and some you win. I'm talking about like fist fights, you know what I'm saying? I'm sorry to tell you this. I've not always been a man of peace, okay? Uh, some I won and well, some I didn't win, you know? I lost. But the problem is when you lose, you get mad. It's the way it goes. You live to fight another day, you know? You got me, watch you back, right? That's what happened. When you lose, you want to come back. This is human nature. And when you win, you're a little concerned that the person you beat might do what? Come back to get you. This is, this is why once you get things stirred up, it's hard to get things shut down. Now, you say, I didn't just bring it up for no reason. Abraham is just embarrassed. I mean embarrassed. A pretty powerful king, Chedorlaomer. I mean, this nomad from nowhere decided he was going to rescue his relative and like knocked off the king. He didn't kill him, just went to his place, walked in and took Lot and came back. Now I can imagine when Abraham gets to his like ugly little spot in the promised land that he's hanging out on as a no man with a no bad with nobody. He probably thinks, man, you know, the Lord's provided. The Lord is, uh, Allow me to knock off Chedorlaomer. I hope he doesn't come back. <laughs> Honestly. And Abraham has a perfect out here. By the way, we can see, because what did the Lord say? I'm going to give you the land. The most natural thing for Abraham to do right now is to get afraid. And then to not be at the home address that Chedorlaomer knows about. <laughs> You know, it'd be, it'd be a good time for him to take a few months vacation down to Egypt. So if Chetel Amor and his, his boys show up, Abraham says, go on fishing, you know, for a little bit. That's just, I mean, this makes perfect sense. And guess what? The Lord comes to Abraham in that moment, because Abraham clearly is thinking about, he's fearful, and he's clearly thinking about abandoning the land once again. And you know what the Lord says to Abraham? First thing. Do not be afraid, Abram. Well, clearly he's afraid. And then the Lord says, I am your shield. I think there's a lesson already to be learned here. Abraham knew that he was not able to rescue Lot because he was some great military man. Abraham was able to rescue Lot because God allowed Abraham to rescue Lot. And he even puts a unique little figure in the text last week by the guy, or two weeks ago, by the name of Melchizedek, who was a priest who said, the Lord did this for you. I hope you know that, Abram. But immediately after the Lord protects Abraham, what is Abraham immediately fearful that the Lord won't do? Protect him. And the Lord says, I hope you're learning here. I am your shield. Don't be afraid. And then here Abraham is awakened once again 
to the idea that God has made a promise to him. He says, your reward will be very great. Now, this would be a perfect moment for Abraham to say, yes, God, I believe you're going to do everything you said you're going to do. You know what Abraham says? Um, since Lot is no longer like in my family, cause I like put him down at the Jordan Valley. Like is Eliezer, is that all I got for an heir now? I mean, this is not a word of faith. This is a word of, well, quite frankly, this is Abraham just thinking like a normal person. Anybody who thinks that faith is just a leap in the dark and that biblical people just trusted God, you know, just willy nilly, that's not the case. Abraham says, wait a minute, you said you're going to create a great nation. To have a great nation, I'm going to have to have some people. Lot is not even like in the family circle anymore. He's down there. Um, I guess the only person when I kick the bucket, because Abraham's not a young guy, he's like, and now God, you give me a lot of stuff, but you've not given me any sons, no daughters. He says, I guess when I die, everything's going to have to go to my chief of staff. Is that what's happening? Is that what's going to happen? He says, you've given me no offspring. So I guess this is the way it's going to happen. It's so interesting that Abraham is trying to, to work God's plan himself. You notice this? He's like, God, I know you promised you're going to do this, but let me show you how I'm going to do your plan. And then God just comes to Abraham and basically says, Abraham, stop trying to figure this out. God tells Abraham, no. You ready for this you ready for the words, this dialogue? It says, now the word of the Lord came to him, that is Abraham, and he says, this is very blunt, this one will not be your heir, Eliezer. Your chief of staff is not going to be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. Now, I want you to notice how Abraham, you can read between the lines, he's going to even misread this. Because Abraham thinks, oh, one comes from my own body, will be my heir. He's like, well, it must come from me, but God didn't say it was going to come from my wife. You'll see, he'll figure this out too. I mean, every way he can figure out how he's going to do God's plan, he's going to do God's plan rather than let God doing his own plan. And God, I think, probably just kind of has enough of this dialogue. Like God's like, I got a plan that I'm going to do. And Abraham says, okay, so God, this is how I'm going to do it. And God's like, no. And then Abraham, well, what about this? No. And then God tells Abraham, look, go outside, look up. And then this is a moment of grandeur, awesomeness. He says, Abraham, you're just missing all of this. I made a plan, listen carefully, that's bigger than you. This plan is as big as me, God, not as small as you. And then he says, look at the sky. I can imagine Abraham looking into the night sky. He says, look at the sky and count the stars if you're able to count them. Then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. Sometimes we need to get a glimpse of how big God's plan is to realize that if that plan is going to be accomplished, guess who's going to have to do it? You tell me. God is. And in this moment of clarity, Genesis 15, 6 is written. When Abraham realizes that the immensity of God's promises are way bigger than Abraham's ability to just work it out himself, it says, Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. I wonder today if you believe that the plan that God has for his world is far bigger than what you can do. I wonder if you believe that the transformation that is needed in your life is bigger than what you can do. I wonder if you believe that the circumstances that are around you are bigger than you can control. I think everybody, when I say that, you go, well, sure. But as soon as I put you in the world and I put you in circumstances, there is this sneaky little thing that happens. We think, oh, at this moment, I'll work it out. 
And Abraham has to be broken down in many ways to say, Abraham, you don't have enough resources to do my plan. But God says, I do. I wonder today if we believe that it is only God who can put an end to sin. It is only God who can conquer death. It is only God who can make all things new. It is only God who can wipe every tear from his eye, every tear from people's eyes. It is only God that can do that. And the only recourse that we really have in light of God's grand plan is to trust him to do it. Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. This is faith. This is the method of us joining and agreeing with God and his plan. If you think Genesis 15, 6 is not that big of a text, it's not that important. Well, the New Testament thinks it's important. But may I say there has always and only ever been one method of salvation, and it has been through faith. We do not try to do God's plan for him. God does his plan and we receive that plan. We receive his works, guess how? Via faith. In Romans chapter four, the apostle Paul reflects on, guess what? Genesis 15, six. He says, and now I quote, it says, uh, it's gonna come on the screen. For what then can we say that Abram, Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, has found? If Abraham was justified by works, then he has something to brag about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Guess where we get a quote? Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. Now to the one who, who, now to the one who works, pay is not considered a gift, but it's something owed. But to the one who does not work, that's what Abraham did, but believes on him who declares righteous the ungodly, his faith is credited for righteousness. In the letter to the Galatians, Galatians 3, 6, 7, 8, and 9, it says, just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. So understand that those who have faith are Abraham's sons. Now the scripture foresaw that, a that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and foretold the good news to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So those who have faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. This is a big deal of a text to realize that God does his plan, God does his work, and the only appropriate response we have is say, God, I believe you. I accept it on my account. Recently, my grandmother, who I call Nana, who some of you know, Rachel, uh, is having a hard time. She's, she's at the nursing home, although she's accepted it, which is wonderful uh, for her, for her life enjoyment. And uh, I often reflect as a person struggles uh, about the contribution that they've made to my own life and the contribution they've made to their world. And I remember when I was first called into ministry and, and, and then later on as I began to learn a lot, um, my grandmother had a few salient things she wanted to say to me as her grandson pastor. And um, my grandmother's lived in the same community for over 90 years now, right here. And she's been like a church going woman her whole time. I mean, even right now, she wants to come to church. But she told me as a younger woman, she was frustrated. She was frustrated in church because she's the type of woman who just wanted to know. She said she sat in church, she sang the hymns, she listened to the prayers, she listened to the sermons, and she just was like, well, what am I supposed to do? And she said she would go week after week and she'd listen intently and you know, read the bulletin and fl flip through the hymnal and look at the Bible and was like, what am I supposed to do? And she said, honestly, she says, you know, she goes, she probably tell you this, she goes, uh, she didn't think she was unintelligent, but she couldn't figure out exactly what was the point of all this talking. She wanted to actually know what she was actually supposed to do as a young woman. And finally, she says she was in a church service and a pastor said to her, 
and said to the, the church, if you want to be made right with God, what you have to do is you cannot work your way into heaven, but you're going to have to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone for your salvation. You're going to have to trust him and not yourself. You're going to have to admit, admit you can and God can. And by putting your faith and trust in Jesus, you can become a Christian. To which she said in her, to herself, well, why in the world didn't you come on out and say that a long time ago? Like here I have been sitting in the pew trying to figure out what in the world I'm supposed to do. And finally somebody came and told it to me straight. And I'm like, well, it took you long enough, you know, to kind of get it out. So my grandmother, you know my grandmother, she got some, she got a hand on her. You know what I'm saying? She says, you'll put it in my face. She goes, I know you've gotten smart and you've learned all this stuff and you, you t tell them all this stuff about the Bible, but don't you dare let them sit there and not, not know what they're supposed to do <laughs> like me. And so I'm here today to tell you what you're supposed to do is the same thing Abraham and Rachel did. You believe the Lord, you trust in Jesus, and it is credited to you as righteousness. That is how what separates a Christian from a non-Christian is the person who has chosen to put their faith in Jesus and the one who has chosen not to put their faith in Jesus. That is the dividing line. It is very clear. In Genesis 15, 6, from Abraham to all the redeemed through the ages, there is one central thing that they all have in common, and that is they realize that God's plan is something God must do, and all they can do is receive it as a gift via faith. Now, you would hope that'd be enough. I mean, it is enough for salvation. You'd hope that moment of faith would be enough for a life of faithfulness. But the, what ends up happening, watch this happen, and I'm running to my conclusion. I've got one more ceremony here that we have to participate in. We don't. Abraham will. We'll watch it, read it. You see, when you become a Christian, you know what you say? God, I cannot do what I need to do for my own salvation. Actually, I'm totally helpless. If you don't show up and show off, I got nothing. That's what you're saying. That's, this is the moment of salvation. That I had a sin debt I could not pay. You paid it. And I can't raise myself from the dead, but you've risen from the dead. And since you've risen, I will rise because of you. It's a full trust relationship. That's what you're saying at conversion. The sad thing is what happens at conversion, sometimes in two weeks after conversion, people forget the posture that they had at conversion. This ends up happening. Okay, God, I'm glad you got that worked out. Now I'm going to take back over for a minute. And God's like, no, no. Faith to faithfulness. Faithfulness, you keep that, you keep that posture. So now guess what? Abram believes the Lord and is credited to him for righteousness. You think now he's just going to, he's going to say, God, now I trust you completely. But you know what Abraham's going to say in verse 8? You ready for this? After this big moment? God, one more question. How do I know I'm going to possess this land? <laughs> I'm sure God's like, you know what God says? We need a ceremony. Okay, the dialogue's not working. We're going we're gonna to need a little ceremony. Here's the second big idea. I'm going to read the text. We'll be done. To develop faithfulness, we should embrace the unconditional nature of God's promise. This ceremony is going to feel weird to you. It's going to feel weird. I'm going to explain it to you. It'll feel a little less weird. But hopefully, more than that, you'll see what God is doing by the time I'm done. We've got to just read it. Look at verse 8. But he said, Abraham, Lord God... How can I know that I will possess it? It's like, come on, man. God doesn't respond with an answer. He says to him, when you start asking God questions, he says, go get a cow and cut it in half. You're in bad shape. That's all I got to say. Okay, but that's, that's, what, that's what God's telling Abraham. Bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. You start collecting animals, man. It means God, the conversation is broken down. That's what I'm saying. So he brought all these to him, to God. 
split them down the middle and laid the pieces opposite each other, and he did not cut up the birds. Well, good for the birds. Um, Birds of prey, watch this, came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and suddenly a terror and a great darkness descended on him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know this for certain, your offspring will be strangers in a land that does not belong to them. They will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. However, I will judge the nation they serve, and afterwards they will go out with many possessions. But you will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a ripe old age. In the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the divided animals." On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, I give this land to your offspring from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River, the land of the Kenites, Kazanites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaim, Amorites, Canaanites, Gergashites, and Jebusites. All right, I told you it was a weird ceremony. Let me explain it to you. Sometimes we need a ritual. And by the way, this makes a lot more sense if you understand the background. Here's the background. Uh, Remember, God made a covenant with Abraham. We don't use the term covenant a lot. We use the term contract. And now contracts in America gotten way out of hand. If you notice, I mean, Doris, here she is a real estate agent. And my goodness, uh, you go to buy a house, it's like, all right, we'd agreed upon the price. And then here they, they come out the back room and they got the contract, you know, they're like, okay. And then you're going to sign here, sign here, initial in the corner. And you have to initial three times on that. And by the way, not only you got initial, but they got initial. Flip it over. You're like, what does this mean? Well, don't worry about it. Just sign it. You know what I'm saying? Lawyers wrote this stuff up. We don't have to know what it is. You can't even read it. It's been Xerox so many times. Just <laughs> sign the thing. You know, that's, that's what's happened. You know, there's a lot of small fine print. And honestly, if anything goes wrong, you're out of money. That's the bottom line. You know what I'm saying? But you're signing it because you just think you're really doing something important. Oh, look, I'm doing I'm legal. And they're just thinking there's so many exception clauses in this thing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right. In Middle East, in ancient world, they said, look, we ain't doing it that way. We got a better way. Cut some animals in half. <laughs> All right. And this is what's supposed to happen. You ready? You start doing contracts like this back in America, people go straighten up and fly right. Because the two parties meet between the divided animals, and then they basically say, if we don't uphold this contract, do unto me what you've done to these animals. That'll, that'll get rid of the fine print in a hurry. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes, sir, okay. All right. So you can make fun of the ancients. They might have figured some stuff out. I wonder if politicians have to give between two animals. You know what I'm saying? May it be done to me. You know, next thing you know, to, Congress straighten up a little bit. You know what I'm saying? We'll be fine printing themselves to death. This is how the ancients did it. Okay. Now, you know, when you read ceremonies like this, you think they, oh, isn't this a great spiritual event? Now, notice, Abraham's an old guy. He's an old guy. And I mean, I sit in an office and read books. I'm like, I feel like I'm half a man some days. You know what I'm saying? Because real men, they get outside and they work. You know what I'm saying? At least that's the way I was raised. You know, what did you do? Read a book? You know, not that reading books is not a bad thing. Abraham, he's an outdoor man. You know, he can handle the outdoors. He's an old guy, though. You ever tried to cut a cow in half? <laughs> I mean, that's not a fun process. You know, I mean, it's like, oh, okay, buddy. You know, I mean, it's... So Abraham, this is his spiritual moment. He's out there sawing the cow, like the Lord told me to. And I got to get the goat, you know, grab the goat, you know, and okay, hold still for me. You know what I'm saying? This is what he's doing. And then it's, I, I'm being honest, this is the process. And then he said, okay, God, we're ready for the contract. God don't show up. You know what shows up? Vultures, birds of prey. So you got old Abraham, like, okay, can, 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 shoo. I came home like last October and there were like, these hideous looking birds on the top of my house. I took a picture. I sent it to actually Gary Youngblood. He's like a bird man. I said, what in the world are these things on my house? He said, man, they have some beautiful looking vultures. I said, what are vultures doing on my house? It was like Halloween. It kind of made me nervous. I feel like an Alfred Hitchcock movie or something. You know, and then to come to find out why are they on my house because of something dead in the woods behind. As soon as you kill something, guess what happens? Birds from nowhere show up. 
So Abraham is out there in this spiritual, this spiritual moment. He's an old guy going chasing birds away all day. And I mean big, ugly, nasty birds, you know? So he's like, all right, well, that's what the Lord told me to do. And guess what happens? Time just keeps ticking on. I mean, I'm reading the text. I'm not making this up. It says, it says that it starts getting dark. Now you're going to wonder, Abraham thinks, well, maybe I messed up. Maybe I shouldn't have cut all these animals in half. Because now it's getting late and nobody showed up. And guess who shows up at night? God shows up. And Abraham thinks he and the Lord are going to meet between the animals for the contract. But then God does to Abraham what he did to Adam. He said, time to go to sleep. I don't need you right now. Actually, you're out of this for a moment. And then guess what? Guess who comes between the animals to say, this is my contract, not our contract. God says, I'm the only one making the promises here. This is what you call an unconditional promise. And then God answers Abraham's question. By the way, sometimes I used to, if I feel this way, sometimes there are folks who ask me a question that they don't really want to sit around for the answer. Because the answer is probably bigger than the question. And God starts telling Abraham the answer. You ready for the answer? He says, how do I know I'm going to possess the land? You ready for the answer? I'm going to read it for you again. He says, know this for certain. Your offspring will be strangers in a land that does not belong to them, and they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. Does Abraham want to hear that? 400 years. And then it says, however, I will judge the nation they serve. He's talking about Egypt. And afterward, 400 years, they will go out with many possessions. But you will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a ripe old age. In the fourth generation, they'll return here. He says, because the people who are here, I'm giving them a little more time to get their act together and repent. But when they don't, I'm going to judge them too. Say that again. <laughs> the tip of the iceberg. God says, yeah, Abraham, I'm going to make good on my word. But it is a, it's not as simple as the questions that you're asking. You're part of the plan, but you're not the whole plan. I wonder today, I mean, honestly, you, you kind of have to make a decision in your life. Do you believe that there's a God who has a plan for this world or do you not believe it? You make that decision. You think there is a God who created the world who will one day come and set the world to rights and it's come in the middle of the time and the person of Jesus and his death and resurrection to show ahead of time that he has all authority. You believe that or guess what? You think there is no plan, there is no purpose, you came from nothing and you go nowhere. Which one do you believe? Weirdly enough, us church folks, kind of believe somewhere in the weird middle of which there is no weird middle in this. You either believe that God has a plan for his world that he will accomplish or you don't. And if you do believe it, guess what? You trust the Lord to do it. Even when you can't see it in, in situations, even say, God, I don't know how you work this out. God, I don't understand this. I don't understand this moment. I don't understand this circumstance. I don't know why you allowed this. But God, I believe that you are God, that you have a plan, and that you said you're going to do something that is apart from anything I am going to do. Let me say this to you, church, today before we leave. Life is confusing. Yes, it is. The future, from our perspective, looks very uncertain. Sometimes the people of God don't act like they should, and some of you have seen it. The future, from our vantage point, can feel bleak, and sometimes the promises of God can feel forgotten. That has been the story of the redeemed 
throughout all of history, including Abraham. However, let me say that God will do what he says he will do. God still reigns. Jesus still saves. The church will still be triumphant. Christ will still return. And one day the world will be made to right. And none of that depends upon us. It all depends upon God. The only thing that, de- that, that God asks of us is, do you believe that I will do it? And the scripture says, Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to him for righteousness. So the day, today the question is, do you believe that the God who said he was going to do something is actually going to do what he said. That's your only job as a human is to say, God, I believe you said you're going to do it. And so I trust that you're going to do it. It doesn't seem like a big job, you know what I'm saying? But to us, it's a huge job because each and every day in the uncertainties of life, it has to be, you know, Tommy believes the Lord and it's credited him for righteousness. Rusty believes the Lord and it is credited. Does believes the Lord. Penny believes the Lord and it's credited him for righteousness because God, I believe your plan is bigger than me, but today I trust you and say, uh, God, you're going to do it. I can't do it. But here, before you do it, I believe you will do it. That is the life of faith. It is just that simple and just that difficult. And so my appeal to you today is, have you done it? You may be like my grandmother, who's sitting there going, what am I supposed to do? There is only one way to have salvation, and that is to put your faith and trust in Jesus. Some of you today have never said, God, I admit I'm a sinner, and by faith, I trust in Jesus, not in what I do, but what he has done for my salvation. The altar is open today. Won't you come and give your heart to Jesus? And if you are a Christian today, I wonder, Do we live our faith in situations where we don't see how we can do it? Do we pull back and try to solve it? Or do we say, God, even in this, I trust you. If your faith is weak today, why don't you come to this altar and say, God, I believe. Help my unbelief. The cry of all of us in some circumstances. Use the altar today if you need it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you that you would help us today to become people of faith. God, when we look around at situations that we can't figure out, God, when we look at promises you've made that we don't see how they're going to happen, God, may we gaze at you, the one who said them, the one who has shown himself to be trustworthy, and may we trust you. And so God, today, for those who have never put their faith and trust in Jesus, may today for the first time they trust you. And for those of us who have trusted in Jesus, may we trust him on deeper levels and for greater things, not because we sense our adequacy to figure it out, but we sense your adequacy, God, to do it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. And as we do, let's declare and put our trust in Christ. You make it easy to love. good and you are kind. You bring joy into my life. You make it easy to trust you. You have never left my side. You've been faithful every time. And all I want
are the fire that leads me through the night. I'll follow you anywhere. There's a million reasons to trust you. Nothing to fear for you are by my side. I'll follow you Come to my rescue Took my place upon that cross You redeemed what I had lost Now my whole world revolving around you You're the center of my life You're the treasure Bless you. Put your trust in Christ. Have a great week.